Saver. All right, guys, I definitely appreciate you dropping in. I have um, the master negotiators, what um, they call you in these uh, corporate streets. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Jack, Jack Lee, you definitely have to uh, help me with your last name. I just said it four different times to myself, and I don't want to butcher it. Twilly. Um, Twilly. That's what, yeah. I, that's what I was doing recently, but I didn't want to mess up in front of you. So uh, uh, I definitely appreciate you jumping on. So um, I know a little bit about you, but if you could uh, share with the group, um, tell us a little bit about Zero Gap and your passion uh, and how you're working in this space. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Jonathan, for allowing me to hop on and have this conversation with you. Y'all, I'm from Louisiana, so I'm just going to get this out in the open. I will say y'all a couple of times, and my background is very unique. I started my career in advertising and publishing, spent a few years in global operations for the Center for Disease Control, working on global immunization. And during that time, really came into my life's work, which is to eliminate the gender and leadership gaps. So what that means is that on average, black women are paid somewhere around 64 cents on a dollar compared to our non-Hispanic white male counterparts. And so that perpetuates in many ways. There's currently just two black women, Fortune 500 CEOs, which is absolutely nuts. And so everything that I do is moving the needle towards closing these gaps. I've written two best-selling books, Navigating the Career Jungle, A Guide for Young Professionals, as well as Don't Leave Money on the Table, Negotiation Strategies for Women Who Work Within Male-Dominated Industries. So that's, in a nutshell, a little bit about me. I'll tell you I love tacos, donuts, and lattes. And I might bring up lattes again because that's a negotiation framework that I created a few years back. So not even uh, no avocado toast? What kind of? um... I I will do an avocado toast. My my cousins call me the bougie foodie. So let me just say, I do like a lot of healthy food, but tacos, donuts, that's my jam. So um, no, it's such, such a great work. And like I said, being in leadership, I I tell people all the time, like I'm always looking uh, at pay and I lead a lot of women and a lot of African-American women. And my ultimate goal in my space and the powers that I have, I've always been trying to level them up, uh, even if I know they're not going to necessarily have that conversation for themselves, just to make sure they're fair and equitable for what they're doing. Um, But a little bit about today or today's topic is, I mean, we all saw the post about the young recruiter who I think was trying to make a uh, a, a uh, cry out to our society and actually try to help move the uh, culture forward that it, it might have backfired a little bit, but it did bring up the overarching discussion of when you discuss salary with an employer, interview, either you're with the company or not, oftentimes we're not having a full length discussion about what that pay looks like. And then when you break it down again into segments, women, African-American women are still the youngest or I'm sorry, lowest paid in terms of salary market share portion. Uh, so ha- having that discussion and how do you even kind of prepare? What what do you say to prepare for that particular discussion? So that, I mean, I don't know if you'll ever not leave money on the table, but you can get a better por- so- piece of the pie in that discussion. Yeah, so many things there. Well, we all saw that viral tweet from the recruiter who, um, who's now, I think she shut down all of her social media. Yeah, yeah, honey, well, shut her down. We're not going to say her name, but just for those, just to recap the tweet, she says that she just got off the phone with a candidate for the job. She offered them somewhere around 80K because wow. they asked for 80K, but she could have paid them up to 130. Exactly. And she said, I gave her 80 something because um, I didn't have the bandwidth to educate her. And then she said something like, know your word hashtag or something like that. And I'm like, okay, let, but you have time to tweet. Right. <laughs> that was the number one response, I think. Right. You got time to tweet this. Here's my deal with a candidate. You will always be your own best advocate. Okay. Yes, you want to work for a company who has the values instilled in their employees that they're going to treat everyone equitably and fairly. So even if you don't ask, they're going to pay you. But at the end of the day, let's be real. 
this person was just bold enough to tweet it. There are a lot of other people who do that and will say, will never say anything publicly. So she did raise awareness. The other thing that we have to um, think about is when you're going into a compensation conversation, you want to set yourself up for success. So first and foremost, learn the market rate. I don't care what you currently get paid. That has nothing to do in some cases with the market rate. So when I educate the community on negotiating, I start with understand what a person gets paid in that title, in that industry, and in that geographic area, even if it's remote. Okay. There's a lot of legislation that's popping up across the country that says that employers cannot require you to disclose your current or past salary history because that perpetuates all of the data that we know where individuals are underpaid. But if you don't know this, then you can walk into a trap where they can act you in a slick way and then you divulge information that puts you under what you should be earning. So before any compensation discussion, Find out the market rate. There are two apps that I would suggest that you use. The Blind app, B-L-I-N-D, and Fishbowl. They have a certain level of anonymity to it where a lot of recruiters will hop in and tell you, hey, this is what you should be asking for. So would you say those are a lot more like uh, my wife has gotten me to looking at this Reddit app now. So Reddit doesn't really use like names and stuff like that yeah um, like facebook and instagram and all that type of stuff so right so those the recruiters are, are more like likely that. they're more likely to tell you the real because their right. name isn't tied to it mm. so so good so it, you really hit upon one thing and like i said i had to learn this too i didn't we're, we were taught to appreciate the job right uh we didn't understand that part of um just the process of getting a job is is having a discussion about compensation. It's uh, for me for the longest time was hey, be happy that they offered you the job. And then mm-hmm. as I started learning, I and really once I started, it was like, hey, how can I get some forward movement in in my salary? The salary negotiation thing was like the first thing that would consistently pop up. Are you even asking for more when you're going in? And then once I got on the other side in the leadership table, and I started really understanding. No one, people want you to be paid fairly. The company wants you to come in paid fairly because if right. you don't come in paid fairly, they lost your engagement to even want to work there before you even started. Like the, right. the interview for the company and culture, all that starts with the interview. So really understanding that whole market rate thing. And then uh, what I have to really take a step back and kind of use myself as an example is, what is your skills truly what is your skills ability years experience or however you want to equate it plus education what does that have the market rates that's somebody coming in me if we're talking if i'm going into a leadership role and in the financial realm i mean i do this i can do this in my sleep so i'm very stern with people hey I know I can get results. I I can tell you 15 different places I've been where I've done this same thing. I don't question me. (laughs) You know what I mean? So I'm now to the point where I've actually changed a little bit of my conversation of confidence. I'm like, okay, you can pay me this and I'll probably accept it, but you're going to get this. And I hold to that even after because I'll tell them, hey, if you remember when we talked, (laughs) I told you you want to pay 90 and this is 120 job. All right, I'm gonna give you 90 work. Or I'm gonna give you 50 work. Don't don't think you get right. a double coupon with me because uh, that's not gonna happen. So I, you I bring mean, up such a good point, Jonathan, because there's this conversation that happens under the radar. Hire a woman because she'll yeah, work people. really hard, and you'll get 110 yeah. out of her yeah. for 30 to 40 percent less right. than what you could pay somebody else. So. Knowing your worth is such an important aspect. That's essentially what you're saying is like know your worth and be able to speak to that with confidence. If professionals don't have a kudos folder or a brag folder where they have demonstrated success, where you have exceeded expectations, you have been on target for deadlines, or you have hit your your internal OKRs or KPIs, whatever your company term uses for your metrics, 
you have to have those handy where you can pull those out and speak to those right. because that is your strong data points that you're going to use in exactly. any negotiation when it comes to your your comp and not just your base comp, your total comp packages right. as well. And uh, you bring up another good uh, point that I wanted to get your take on how much or how often are you seeing that, hey, you're you're going in to fight a battle and you lose the war because you're focused too hard on the base and you're not oh. looking at the total yeah. picture because you're going in talking about base. <laughs> They're talking about total compensation. Yeah. And now, like you said, the popularity of trying to get people to understand that total compensation mindset, companies give you pay statements. They can tell you, hey, this is how much you're paying for benefits. This is how much you're paying in 401k. This is how much we're paying you yeah. totally. You need to understand that to be able to compare, hey, when I go to this place, am I being compensated, like I say, fairly? I'm not even trying to price gouge nobody. I just want it fair. You know what I mean? Yeah. We're, we're working for fair. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> like, but still, you, you do need to understand because so many people are, hey, oh, I'm, I'm so focused on the base. Well, truth be told, the higher you go on the ladder, and income wise, you know what I mean? Especially the closer you creep to that 100K range, once you get closer into that, it's less about the base and it's more about the compensating the factor. Yeah. yeah, especially when you get into, you know, mid six figures, mm -hmm. right? So the conversation about your base pay, that's important because oftentimes your 401k match is going to be tied to that base pay. Your raises will be tied to that base pay. So that is an important element. But when we zoom out and we look at your bonus rate um, over the next year to two, three years, you want to see what you're going to bonus out at. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the professionals that I've seen in colors of community, especially black communities, this is something that we're new to speaking about when exactly. we're negotiating um, both the performance bonus as well as the signing bonus. Oh, yes. As a community, oh, my we goodness. can do a much better job about the signing bonuses, which I'm... on average is about 7% of what your base is. So again, that base is important. But when you zoom out and you have the, the conversation about total compensation, which is your full benefits package, mm -hmm. including any stock, stock options yeah. or if you're at a tech company, any equity that you may have in that company coming in and when those things best, you want to look at those full pictures. So if that's something that you don't know about, again, the blind app and the the app. Um, Bowl can educate you on that if you're not using the coach. This is where a coach comes in handy. A coach can help you increase that base 30 to 40 percent or that total comp. And so sometimes, because I do work with people in the coaching capacity, they'll say, Oh, well, you're almost five hundred dollars an hour. You know, I'll just figure it out myself. I'll watch a YouTube video. And I have hundreds of YouTube videos for free. I have over exactly. 200 podcast episodes exactly. for free as well as books. But if you really want somebody to look at it and guide you through and say, hey, you should be looking at this. Oh, when you're leaving this company, you're only a few months from this vesting, exactly. negotiate a separation package, not just going into a company, you can negotiate on the back end. Mm -hmm. So you, you want to curate your network, your social circle professionally, where you can tap into coaches that can be a resource for you, that can help you look at these big picture things so you don't leave money on the table. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, and it nice, uh, nice plug because I was gonna definitely get get that. I, I wait on, on on my copy here and there uh, for that for that book, but yeah, it's so it's so much being left uh, on the table from like you said, you just got vested from a company. You're about to leave. Obviously, we're in February, right? So a lot of people are doing traditionally their um, payouts and things of that nature. And you, yeah, hey, you got a great, I know a lot of people turning yeah, into their resignations after so they excited, get the bonus. I'm like, one week can, you know what I'm saying, make you miss, leave 10, 15 grand on the table that you earned from last year. Mm -hmm. And then they not paying you where you're going for what you left. And right. it's so many times that happens. But what happens? Or just thinking, 
people don't understand how this money thing really works. But what if, hey, I left the job where I got 15 grand for my work last year. I got to sign on for another 10, 12 to come into the new company. Plus, I'm making a raise where I'm going. Well, you mm -hmm. just unleash $27,000 like that yeah. in one swift move just because you didn't you didn't discount what you had and you made sure you held the new people accountable. Um, I didn't want to speed past too fast. One of the questions that came in, uh, it might be ahead of the conversation, but are you able to renegotiate your pay in your current role if you aren't being paid the current market rate? So I'm assuming based off the language, you're, you're at the job or you got in the door and yeah. you've you been watching some YouTube videos or something and you you didn't figure it out, hey, I'm not being paid right. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? What does that uh, come in? So the short answer is yes. But it is much harder to negotiate after you've already accepted because the budget has already been set, exactly. right? Similar concept applies when you want to look at your performance review and then negotiate a raise. A lot of times the fiscal year budget has already been set by the time you have your performance review. Yeah. So you need to wait until the next cycle because budgets are real. The constraints are real. Mm -hmm. So if you went into a company and you didn't get the market rate for whatever reason, now that you know that, you want to have casual conversations. Don't go in guns blazing with anything formal. To whom it may concern, I have not been paid properly. Right. <laughs> right. Go in very casually. Uh, I would say if you have a, like a one-on-one -on -one check in, hey, I noticed that the market rate for my role is X, Y, Z. Right. So maybe in the future we can have a full discussion about that. Because you have now had the information, the person you're talking to, they're going to be caught off guard and sometimes get defensive if you come at them too aggressive. So I call this priming the pump. Mm -hmm. Let them know this is something you want to talk about it by give them some time to digest it. And I will also say this. Don't go straight to HR. Right. HR, my such and such and such isn't paying me because in that type of scenario, HR has to protect the company. Exactly. So what you've done is you just put them on alert to start looking at you with extra scrutiny so that That's they right. can find a cheap way out. Yeah. So if you do want to negotiate this, go in with a casual approach, prime the pump and use language like once you do have the formal conversation, hey, what can we do about this to get me to market rate? Mm -hmm. Don't make it a me versus you because that becomes a battle. Make it collaborative. What can we do so that we can bring me up to market rate? And um, I mean, like I said, I'm, I'm in the personal finance piece all the time. And one thing that I've learned just in my personal career and anybody I've had conversation with that I'm like, to be honest, the money conversation really should be you have one on ones at least once every month. Everybody does it at least once every month. A good yeah. manager, a good leader, they'll probably meet with you two, three times a month. But it's getting now to the point that you really do have to make that a little 10, 15 minute piece of your regular conversation because Things, values, and strategic objectives change in the organization every all the time. The second thing is if you're going to stay in that role, if you're staying with that company, number one, by the time they have a conversation with you, and I've seen this with colleagues' companies, and I've worked and I do work for very large financial institutions, and I've seen how they've changed, they'll do all the raise and all that type of stuff at the end of well, in this case, 2021, and then they'll talk to you after everything's been approved and done when nothing else can be switched in 2022 and you're ready to talk, but it ain't no talking with them at that point. Because like you said, the budget's been set. They already dished out the money. They simply come to you and like, hey, we just letting you know. It, it wasn't no two-way conversation. So right. having that conversation of, you know what I'm saying, around or th consistently throughout the year is going to be important because to your point, you're your best advocate. The most people, and I work, most leaders in the organization, I'll be frank, they're looking at, they don't even like spending all the budget money, first of all. Second, they're not looking at it like, oh, this person has a mouth to feed or anything or any of your goals. That, that's not how they're looking at it. It's right. Simply, oh, <laughs> most importantly, Jonathan, they, they don't care about your personal budget expenditures. <laughs> you always have the conversation from the point of view of the value that you add to the organization. Exactly. So talk about your metrics. Over the yeah. past nine months or 14 months, I've been able to hit 
89% of my targets, but I have been 110% above this and I did this. Whatever key performance indicators that your company uses to measure your performance, right. those are the things you want to talk about when you go in to ask for that performance or, or raise. I, someone came to me last week um, and I asked if I could talk about this scenario. I won't give any personal details, but they said, you know, I got to start paying my student loans back in a couple months. So I'm going to need to ask my boss for a raise. So I'm going to just let them know student loans coming up. I was like, what you will not do <laughs> is go in because, that's not their problem, yeah. right? But if you frame it and you take the narrative and say, you know, I've been coming in or working remotely and I've been doing this and this is the value I've added to the team, to right. you, to the organization, and you lay out those metrics, they are way more inclined to engage you in a conversation because you have discussed your value. Now they're saying, oh, yeah, we don't want to lose this person. This person adds some significant value. We are still in the middle of the great resignation. Exactly. So you want to be able to not threaten anybody or give them an ultimatum when it comes to your company. But again, speak to the value you add as your leverage to get more of what you want. And that's, uh, I'm so glad you mentioned that. But also with the great resignation, one of the things that um, comes up is what if you do take advantage and you go seek your talents uh, and get the raise, you get the sign on, you get all this great stuff out in the open market. And then you come back and now they want to have a different discussion with you. What I have my own point of view about it, but uh, I would be interested to hear you, what are your thoughts on, okay, now the employer wants to talk after you went and got something else. Yeah. So statistically speaking, once you receive a counter offer, if your current company comes in, the counter that um, offer to keep you within six to nine months, you're going to leave. Trust has been severely broken. That's just a, a stat that's been long standing for decades now. So once you get to that point, you need to know the reality of the situation. You might stay short term, but if you have already made up in your mind that you would entertain something else, it's like you're going to be nitpicky. Oh, they did this. See, I should have left. So if you make that decision to leave, to start exploring other opportunities, be very conscious that even a counter offer, you could still end up walking in a few months. The other thing is, to this point, sometimes people like to play this game and say, oh, to use leverage to get more money for their company, com uh, current company, they'll say, oh, I have another offer. Huh. Some companies will call your bluff. Yep. So. You want to be wise in your approach. This is, again, why it's so important to have a strong professional network where you have mentors and advisors and coaches who can guide you through this process. Because I have seen, not a lot, but I have seen in some rare instances, an employee tries to use that and then they find themselves with no position. Again, it's super rare, but don't play yourself. And then uh, one of the last questions that I definitely have to address before we get into where how – uh, everyone can connect with you is the biggest fear of people asking for more money is, oh, they're going to take the offer away. Oh, yeah. that That's so hyped up. That is overhyped. It is a fear that is not based in a lot of reality. I actually talked about this earlier today to um, a group of executive women. It doesn't matter if you're making $50,000 or $400,000. You have the same concern. It's going down to mindset. If I ask for more, they will take this away from me. And as long as you're not giving an ultimatum, like you give me this or I'll walk, this is a negotiation. The conversation will flow two ways. So I would say to that point, there's a book that I recommend. It's by Carol Dweck. She's a psychologist. The book is called Mindset, The New Psychology of Success. Mm -hmm. She talks about a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. So for anyone struggling with that battle of if I ask for more, the offer will be gone. I want you to focus on your mindset first. Your first negotiation is always with yourself. And then you can start using some negotiation strategies to advocate for more of what you want. Mm, so good. So good. Jacqueline, I definitely appreciate you stopping through um, and sharing just your wisdom. It's so important, especially right now. But it's always been important, but it, it never could have gotten more light than where we are right now, just economy state. Um, where can uh, the people connect with you? 
Thanks, Jonathan, for having me on tonight. My favorite place to hang out online is LinkedIn. So Jacqueline's fully on LinkedIn, but I'm on all the social media platforms. So YouTube, podcast, you pop in my name, you'll see me um, come up. And my company, Zero Gap, zerogap.co. We have current enrollment open for women who work in male-dominated industries, our Resilient Leaders Program. It is a three-month leadership intensive and we focus on the pillars of confidence, clarity, and personal leadership strategy so that you can effectively lead others while getting paid where you work. Oh, so so good. Guys, I definitely appreciate your time. And Jacqueline, definitely want to be respectful of your schedule. Um, but yeah, check her out. I'm going to definitely get, gather all that information and send it out to you here in the group so you'll have that. Um, but yeah, it's so important. This is how you move yourself forward. I can't wait to see you guys in the next video. <laughs>